you're all very welcome. Uh, good to see you all uh, on such a, a miserable night. Um, you're all very dedicated, so thanks for coming. Um, anyone who doesn't know me, um, I'm Brian McCabe. I'm chairman of the Kildare Federation of Local History Groups, under whose auspices um, this series of talks uh, are being carried out. This is the fifth in our series. Um, we have had to change around the December and January speakers for circumstances beyond our control, so we're very grateful to Mary here for bringing her uh, talk forward from January. And anyone who wants Liam Kenny's talk, um, which was scheduled for tonight, that, that will now be in, in January. Um, the theme of, of the series really is we wanted to concentrate on, if you like, the real St. Bridget, the, the historic figure of St. Bridget. And um, I think Mary's talk fits very definitely into that category. Um, uh, Mary McGrath is our guest speaker. Um, a woman with a very interesting background and CV, um, I've been looking it up, um, from uh, living and studying in Spain, um, studying in the Courtauld Institute in London, uh, a fellowship to Harvard, is that right? Um, and here in Ireland she's worked in the uh, Hugh Lane Gallery and done contract work for uh, the National Gallery, the National Museum and IMA. And as if that's not enough, she was involved in the move of Francis Bacon's famous studios from London back to Dublin. But I think it's fair to say that uh, Mary's heart really lies in the natural world. Um, uh, her passion is conservation, endangered indigenous species, and horses, I think it's fair to say, Mary, <laughs> particularly. So tonight, Mary's going to talk, if you like, about the natural world of St. Bridget the world around here as it, as it would have been back in the time of St. Bridget. So over to you, Mary. Lovely to see you and thanks for coming out. Dreadful night, dreadful night. So um, yes, Bridget uh, of Kildare, Forest and Farm. My background, uh, as Brian said, is in farming, and I grew up on the Curra, um background uh, of horses and dogs and, you know, country life generally. And so, uh, whenever uh, I, I'm not approaching this from an academic point of view, I'm bringing it with all the baggage that I carry, and talking about what I think Bridget's life must have been like uh, years and years ago, and what links we have today. With the, with the kind of life that she led. So this was my idea of Bridget, uh, not the sort of tall woman with the red hair and the cloak. I think she was an ordinary woman with a big heart, a uh, country woman, and she had an unshakable faith. And in fact, she was a subsistence farmer. Now, a subsistence farmer has to make and grow everything that they wear and that they eat and everything has to be created from around where they, where they lived. So here we have a map of the Curra, and Kildare is here. There are 12 roads leading into Kildare, and this map shows the, the orange things are bogs, and then there's the trees, and then the blue are hills, and the Curra is sort of nestled between the Liffey, which is over here, and lots of woodland all around. And so if Bridget was to survive as a subsistence farmer in Kildare, she needed access to grazing lands for her cattle because life at that time was all about cattle. So the story of the cloak, um, whether it happened or didn't happen, or whether um, there's some truth behind it because Bridget managed to get the grazing for her cows on the curra, and that was something very, very special and boils down to her personality and her, her Christianity and her approach to the local king. And anyway, she got the grazing of the land on the curra. Now the curra was, um, uh, you can see here, the, this is a map of the curra. 
and the the cattle from Kildare, the 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 homestead or the the church would have been here, and then the cattle would have gone out to graze here on the curra during the day, and sometimes they were too far away to come back at night time, and they had in the um in the, in the woodlands uh, they had problems with um wolves. This is the sound that they would have heard at night time on the curra. And so they had to get their animals into these rats. You see all these rats around around the, the little circular ones, and there were probably lots more. But when the howling began at night time, uh, they had to get their animals, their sheep, their cattle, their goats, their pigs, into the rat uh, uh, to shelter them from the onslaught of the wolves that were constantly on the prowl. And they lived in all the woods around about. And so um, it was, it, farming was pretty difficult on a whole lot of different fronts. So this is just the basic background to where the, the, the monastery was located and how important the Curra was then to, um, to bridge it. So this is the monastic settlement in Kildare. And on the left hand side, you can see uh, Leo Swan uh, has gone around and taken from the existing bits of wall and the street patterns and things like that, he has worked out where the enclosed settlement would have been. And on the right hand side, I have done um, a sort of possible reconstruction of what was in Kildare. It's based on Nendrum in County Down. And uh, in the centre, you would have had the church and the oak tree and probably where Bridget lived. And then outside that, you would have had the monks and their, where they cooked their food and that sort of thing. Um, they would have had um, little beds for growing some um, um, you know, plants and things like that for, for cooking. All around here then, it would have been um, a sort of a special area, a sort of reserved area and for special um, animals. And when the, uh, the cattle came in from the, the curra, they would have been in these sort of fields here. And then you had horses and pigs and sheep uh, in the outside circle around here. And also they grew flax and they grew sort of herbs and things. And then they had their beehives. They were inside the wall because if they hadn't been inside the wall, somebody would have stolen the honey. So there were two main gates out of it, one here onto the curra uh, with a, probably a cross and then another one here out to Offaly and our roads west and again there would have been another cross and there would have been a gatekeeper in a gatekeeper's hut and their role at night time would have been to close the gate uh, and to keep out all comers because um, there was a constant um, threat of cattle rustling and um, I'll get onto the cattle later but it was a sort of almost like a siege mentality and inside the mon monastic settlement were the higher orders of the clergy. And then outside in the area surrounding it, there were sort of laymen uh, or married monks uh, in a lot of cases. And in exchange for um, the blessings of the church and the cures and the care of Bridget and her, her, her uh, nuns and um, uh, the people the, who the the trades people who worked in in conjunction with the monastery, and um, they gave part of their time as labour in the fields, so it was quite a a bustling um, centre, and James Journey maintains that the population would have been around about five hundred, so that's not very big, and um, the 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 country, uh, Ireland at that time was divided up into about 150 kingdoms and they say the overall population of Ireland was only about half a million. So the population of Kildare, the Tua in Kildare would have been maybe 1500 and then 500 in this place. You know, it, they, it was sp uh, sparsely populated but the population <laughs> around Kildare would have been uh, as James says, around about 500 and they would have um, existed on uh, what they could grow and what they um, could produce by way of animals and things like that. So these are the animals that there would have been in the forest and the woodland around about. 
um, a lot of these we still have today. Um, we have red deer, we have um, uh, boar and um, uh, the wolves have gone. But we have foxes, red squirrels, um, um, pine martens, bats, badgers, um, pygmy shrews and um, a stoat and bats. So we know this because um, there's a, a, a very um, good book by a man called Fergus McCormick and he uh, has gone around and he has analysed all the bones found on archaeological sites and he's able to say these animals existed and the, the most prevalent bones naturally enough were cattle because people uh, you know c um, kill cattle and the cattle was used for feasting and that sort of thing next in line then were pig bones and then after that there were miscellaneous things that they had caught hunting and things like that but these are the animals of the forest and woodland that Bridget would have known they would have been sort of you know uh, commonplace to see because they there were no very few threats there was nobody shooting them um, hunting was something that was reserved for the upper classes it was a very sort of um, uh, recherche thing not everybody could hunt not everybody had permission to hunt and so um, these animals were would have been quite tame and this is why you talk about um, St Kevin and the birds like there'd be nobody hunting those birds so in Bridget's time all these animals would have um, coexisted with her and we still have them today all those animals would have been very familiar to Bridget and these are animals that weren't in Ireland in the 5th century that we think might have been there. So they didn't have rats. Rats only came in later. Um, they didn't have rabbits. Rabbits came in with the Normans. Mink, yeah, yeah, we didn't have that. Gray squirrels, we didn't have. Hedgehogs, we, they didn't have. They came in later too. And fallow deer, they all came in later. So um, these weren't, uh, you know, things that we assume have always been there. In fact, didn't come in until, you know, medieval times and much later in some cases like the, the squirrels only came in I think in the 1930s so you know um, it, it's interesting what was there and what wasn't there and it's not until you actually start looking at it that you sort of see um, what Bridget would have had and what she wouldn't have had so these are the animals now that would have been on the bog land and the open ground the Irish hare and the Irish hare has been here since almost the last ice age and it's very different genetically to the English hare it has shorter ears it um, it's it's genetically quite quite distinct and it's more closely related to the the north the northern ones that go white in winter and um, but it's specifically an Irish hare and these are under threat nowadays because they don't like um, grazing where there are cattle or intensive farming and nowadays with all the land taken up with the farming they're really you know pushed away and there's a lovely Irish expression of the hare's corner I don't know whether you you know that expression but in the old days they would always leave the corner of the field with long grass in it and they called it the hare's corner and nowadays they when they talk about the hare's corner it's it's what's what's left you know everything else is gone and, and there's only just this small bit like and um, it's like the Irish language you know the hare's corner is Dingle and and the, the west of Ireland and Donegal but it's it's been pushed to the other and the same thing is happening to the Irish hare so otters there are stories of Bridget and the otters and the natterjack toad the newts the lizards and wood wood mice and um, we know there were mice because I'm sure everybody remembers Pangor Vaughan, the, oh, the, yes. the manuscript man writing in the, in the marge and talking about Pangor Vaughan hunting the, hunting the, uh, the, the, the mice. These, these weren't found in Ireland in the fifth century, so um, I think I've been through most of these before, but they didn't have bears. The bears had already died out. Um, some people thought that there were bears down in the south of Ireland at the same time that Bridget existed, but in fact they had they had died out before. So, this is the the dawn chorus. Um, we hear this today, and it's exactly what Bridget would have heard in her day. When we wake up in the morning, we hear what she would have heard, and um, the rhythm of the year 
you know, the dawn chorus comes to a full thing in the beginning of May and then it dies off and then starts again the following year. But this is exactly what Bridget would have heard. And so we have a number of things that we, we still have that, um, you know, that, that haven't disappeared. You know, they're, they're links with Bridget's time. It's 1500, 1500 years is sort of nothing in geological terms. And we still have these sounds and we still have the, the actual birds, this range of birds, again, based on uh, bones that are found in archeological excavations. So it's really quite, quite interesting. So this is the curlew. Um, the curlew is, um, again, almost extinct. Um, um, the curlew, there were, there were 50,000 breeding pairs back in the 1970s. And now there's 150. And they have just, again, it's the different types of farming that we, we are up against. Uh, intensive farming, draining land, um, you know, um, predation by mink and rats, and they've uh, they lived in bogs, and a lot of the bogs have been overworked, and so that area has gone too. And um, in an, in a no number of cases, they've planted trees on the boglands, and of course. That allows the crows and the birds of prey to sit on top of the trees and look around and say, oh, there's a nest, the be eggs in that, and go down and eat them. So even when they try to breed here, they're having difficulty because of the amount of vermin and things. So th this year now, they've, for the first time, they've um, had a, a little increase. So it's gone up from the 150. It was 150 last year, and it's gone up a little bit this year. So hopefully now, uh, in, in years to come, the, the curlew will come back. It's still prevalent in, in Europe, and, um, but just we're on the fringes here, and um, it's just been pushed out by our farming methods. These are birds that were found in Ireland in the fifth century. The pheasant was a later import, and it was, it was for the big estates. They liked their shooting on the big estates. So that was a, a later import. Magpie. Um, only came in in the 18th century and they didn't hunt with falcons um, and they were they weren't again didn't come in until the Norman times when it was a sort of a sport that the Normans took took part in so now we get down to the real nitty-gritty the basis of Bridget's um, farm and farming existence were cattle and the same went for the rest of Ireland. And it wasn't just cattle, it was cows, female cattle, because uh, they, they were the ones that gave the milk. And the, from the milk, you could make cheese and you could make butter. And then you could kill off the male calves and you could get meat. So cattle were hugely important. And the type of cattle would have been small black cows, um, like Kerry cattle. And they have been in Ireland since very early since Neolithic times and um, they were the most common cattle that were around. So when uh, the whole of the whole of Bridget's year and the Bridget's day would have been tied up with the cattle. So you got up in the morning, you had to milk the cows. You couldn't keep the, the cows bred a calf once a year and the calf was left with the cow for about a month. And then they would separate the calf from the cow and they would milk out three of the cow's teeth and then let the calf in to feed on the fourth one. And then the calf would be taken away and the cow would be milked again in the evening time. In the, in the meantime, the cow had to go out and graze and the calves had to be kept away from the cow. So you read a lot about um, Bridget's miracles of keeping the calves away from the cow. She would draw a line in the ground and all the calves would stand one side of the line and then the cows would be grazing the other side of the line. But the whole of the day was tied up with milking the cows, bringing them out to graze, um, keeping the calves away, uh, bringing the cows back in, milking the cows, uh, letting the calf feed, separating the calf from the cow. It was all very, very cow oriented, the whole thing. And in the meantime then, out on the curra, if the cows were out on the curra, 
sometimes they weren't able to bring them back in because they were too far away but somebody would have to bring the milk because they had no way of keeping the milk so the milk would have been carried on somebody's back or in a horse and cart from the Curra back to the monastery where it would have been turned into milk or cheese and um, the window uh, of, of production was very very short so the cows would be in calf and they would calve say in May and then you'd have a month with the calf uh, on the cow so you'd really only be getting the milk from June, July, August, September and by the end of September the, the lactation period would be nearly over so you had to make make the best of that particular window of time so in that time you also had to mate the cow for the following year because a cow carries a calf for nine months so the cow would want to be mated say in September in order to produce the calf the following May so the whole year was tied up with things to do with cattle so the the natural thing in nature is for cows to produce 50% female, 50% male calves. So the male calves were surplus to requirements and they would have been killed off in September, October time. And that would have been a sort of time of feasting and they would have eaten the, the, the meat of the male calves. And then they would have tanned the hide of those calves in order to make vellum. And so nothing was wasted. Every single bit of the cow was used. You know, the horns were used as drinking vessels. The bones were used to make combs. Uh, the hides were used for, for shoes and things like that. And the calf's skin was for vellum. So the cattle really um, were absolutely vital to the success and the survival of the monastery. So these are the principal cattle that were around. But then there's the special one the Drimmen. And I'm sure you all learned at school Drimmen down the Elish, you know, the, the poem. So the Drimmen is a type of cattle and Drum Fionn, it has a white back and um, it was um, prevalent in, in Bridget's time, but it wasn't very common. Uh, it was bigger than the um, black cows and sort of a status symbol. So on royal sites, they found bones of the the bigger of the drimmen because uh, you know it was if you had a couple of drimmen in your hair you were you were somebody but uh, most of the time they were um, brown with a white back or white and every now and again and once in a generation you get a calf with um, a, a red nose and red ears and in all the stories Bridget had a cow with red ears and a red nose and so we know it was a, a drimmen. And I'm one of my big interests is in native rare breeds and the drimmen still survives today. Um, it nearly died out again because people were breeding for improved um, milk yield and you know greater bulk and in, in for meat and uh, they were constantly trying to make a, a bigger and better cow. Uh, and the Drimmen just didn't meet, meet up with what they needed. But the, the great thing about those Kerry cows, t Kerry type cows and the Drimmen is that they can survive on very little. And the Irish didn't make hay. So the cattle had to get sufficient condition on them over the summer in order to survive the winter and, and carry a calf. And then uh, in the springtime, like when it was the really hungry period and they'd be feeding a calf. So you needed somehow or other to keep a bit of grazing for the cows in order to get them producing the milk again. So, you know, you can see cattle were absolutely vitally important. So anyway, this is the Drimmen and the Drimmen is um, uh, the um, Inish Boffin is Inish Bofinna, you know, the, um, the the island of the thing. And the Milky Way is Balak and Bofinna. So it, it, it the Drimmen has been around for a long time and it had its place in Irish Irish um, st stories and, and folklore and that sort of thing. Okay, so these are the cattle byproducts and um, everything associated with them. So in your monastery, they would be using the milk, they'd be making cheese and butter, 
and of course they would, that would have been made in the summertime and in order to have it in the winter time this is where bog butter comes from they would bury it because they had no other way of preserving it and they're still being turned up today um, uh, where people didn't go back to collect it um, they had beef they had bone marrow which was an um, uh, um, everybody loved bone marrow because you could put it in a, a stew or something um, uh, they had blood products for black puddings and things they had hides to make shoes out of they had tallow for the candles they had bones for um, as I say for combs and for uh, needles and for pins for cloaks and things like that they had horns for drinking vessels and sort of symbolic things um, casking, a casking for vellum and then the dung was used to fertilise the beds inside and around the monastery so every single thing was used the, the professions associated with them were there was cow herd and that was somebody who went out to say the Curra Plains with the cattle and lived with the cattle for the period of time that they were out there then there was the milkmaid when the milk was brought into the centre the milkmaid would have um, looked after it or when she, when she was out on the on the curra, sometimes they milked the cattle out on the open range and then somebody would have had to bring it back to the centre. At the centre, somebody would have made butter, somebody would have made cheese. There would have been a butcher to kill off the calves and to butcher them and to get all the bones out of them and that sort of thing. There would have been a tanner to make the leather and um, oak bark is used as a tanning agent and oak was very prevalent around Kildare so they would have been able to tan the leather to make it more supple and um, more long lasting so they would have had leather workers who made belts and who made shoes and that kind of thing harness maker for horses candle maker with the tallow um, to give light because otherwise they would have no other means of light and this time of the year you can imagine uh, when it gets dark at half past four or five o'clock time it was a very very long night and you were sort of stuck there in um, in, the, in the dark unless you had tallow candles and they were very valued so then you had the comb maker the wheelwright now wheels are very complicated because you have the hub which is one type of wood you have the spokes which is another then you have the fellows that go around spokes are usually um ash because they it's it, it's bends and and like everybody knows the hurley bends so the spokes were ash and then the fellows were usually elm or oak and then there was an iron band around the outside so each part of the wheel was a separate process and so a wheelwright was a very skilled individual and very highly sought after position and then cart builder the rest of the cart had to be built so you had to cut down a tree you had to establish planks out of the tree you had to uh, let it settle then you if you wanted to have nails you had to get somebody to make the nails or you had to do wooden joints so you know it was everybody had to pull their weight and it was this is the subsistence aspect of the thing everything was produced from within the society and then the um, the actual um, uh, um, unit of, of currency was a cow. Everything was in terms of cows. So um, uh, a cow, um, I, I can't read this thing, um, t uh, ten ounces, one ounce of silver uh, uh, was uh, uh, the price of a cow. And um, uh, one female slave was three cows. And then there was a set which was a half a cow and they had all of these things um it was a sort of universal currency the cow was the universal currency and it, sometimes they had good years and sometimes they had bad years but the currency stayed the same and so it was a very stable currency so for hundreds of years up to the time of bridget and, and for a hundred years or so afterwards the society was very stable because it was based on a stable currency which consisted of things to do with the cow. The cow was a basic thing. And if it was a good year or a bad year, the currency stayed the same. So people knew exactly where they were. So they were used for rent, uh, for fines, for tributes, bride prices, and fosterage fees. So cows were the, the business. So you had to have your cows. 
So this is the thing cows kept away from the calves. When they were milking the cows, there's a special word in Ireland for um, a post that you tie the calf up to. So sometimes the cows wouldn't let down their milk if they couldn't see the calf. So they would tie the calf so that the cow could lick the calf and feel the calf and the cow would let down the milk and then the person milking the cow would milk out the three, three teeth and let the calf in at it afterwards and then separate the cows again. So sometimes this is done nowadays and obviously they use electric fences to keep the calves separate but it, is, um, it was very much part of uh, Bridget's daily life. Then the 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 driven um, the male driven a lot of them were castrated and used as oxen to plow with, and um, the if they were breaking new ground, you had a team of four oxen, and a lot of what we know about life in Bridget's time comes from old law tracts, and there's a wonderful man called Fergus Kelly who wrote a book called Early Irish Farming. And he uh, trolled through the ancient law tracts and extracted all the bits that are relevant to farming. And his book is in print and it's just a treasure trove. So he, um, and, and, and you can read in his, in his book, like the, the man who owned the plough would get the biggest share of the money. And then the man who owned the, the, the bullock on the, the left hand side nearest the plough, he got the next lot. And then the bullock on the other side, the man who owned that got the next lot and the front ones were next. And then the, the man who led the cattle and then the man who drove the cattle. Everybody had a price that they got from the team ploughing and everybody knew what it was. It wasn't written down, but we have this fantastic oral tradition that was never sort of interrupted because we were never invaded by the Romans or anything. So this oral tradition went along and people knew exactly what it would cost, uh, what they were, what, not what it would cost, what they would earn from lending their animal to, to the plough. And then if the land had been ploughed before, uh, it was adequate to have two, two oxen to do the ploughing and you'd have one person leading them and then one person driving them. So the crops they grew, um, oats, oats were the most common and porridge was the sort of main meal. And what's really interesting is they didn't have ovens. The oven didn't come along till much, much later. So they cooked things on a griddle or they cooked them over an open fire or they cooked them in a pot and they stewed things, but they had no ovens. So the oats were the commonplace one and they were easiest to grow and they could put up with quite a damp climate. Whereas barley and wheat were more temperamental. Wheat was the gold standard. If you had wheat, you were doing well. So, you know, high class families would have had wheat. So they had, they grew flax for linen shirts because again, if you read the descriptions of what people wore, they wore their, their brought their, their cloak, but underneath they had a lena, which was made out of linen. So everybody needed to be able to, to, to grow flax. And then in the, in the homestead, somebody would um, process the flax and weave it into uh, fabric, and then somebody else would make up the clothes. So it, again, they were self-sufficient. They grew sallies in order to make baskets. So um, they were completely, um, you know, they, didn't, they weren't able to go down to um, Ikea and buy cups, you know, they had to make things themselves and, and use things that they made. So they had carrots, parsnips and cabbage. So they didn't have potatoes and they didn't have soda bread. So the things that we think is purely Irish didn't exist. Bread soda wasn't invented until the 19th century. So the bread they would have had would have been more like um, um, sourdough uh, and they would have, you know, kept it and brought it along and baked it again on the griddle and kept some of the some of the 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 raw uh, stuff to, as a as a starter for the next lot of um, of, of meal. So, um, yes, yeah, so so roasting, roasting was a big thing. Uh, over an open fire, stewing and uh, the griddle. They were the main things. So um, again, it was all in-house. So after cattle, pigs were the main thing that they had. 
and the wild boar, you see it on the left, but the old Irish pig is very like the wild boar. And it was what's called a land race breed, where it wasn't improved. It was just basically a boar that was tamed and they, they had it and it didn't give a huge amount of meat, but um, it thrived on very little. And around Kildare, they would have fattened them up on the acorns from the oak forest. And um, if you see any early manuscript illuminations, the man herding the pigs always has a big stick with a crook on the top that he would use to shake down the acorns out of the trees for the, for the, the pigs. So the greyhound pig, anyway, when the English um, saw the greyhound pig, they thought it was just a bit of a joke. And the first thing that they always wanted to do when they came to Ireland was to improve things. They wanted to have a bigger and better pig. They wanted to have bigger and better horses. They wanted to have bigger and better goats. Everything they wanted to improve things. So the, the old Irish pig lasted until about 1890, and then the last one became extinct. But it was very much part of life in Bridget's time. Then the type of sheep they would have had um, would have been, again, an unimproved type of sheep, uh, more like a goat, in fact. And there's a, a, a traditional sheep called a clador sheep, which is um, uh, it's quite rare and it has a, a, a sort of very sad backstory in that um, a, 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 an old farmer in, in the west of Ireland uh, knew about these sheep and decided that he would try and save them from extinction because, again, everybody was using new improved sheep. So he collected in his lifetime about 60 of these sheep and he gave them to the Department of Agriculture for safekeeping. And the man who was in charge of them in the department fell ill and somebody else sent them to the factory and didn't realize what they had, which was a, a unique genetic link with <laughs> times past. So nowadays they're trying to find a few remnants and they're using DNA analysis to see if they can find the core thing of the DNA so they can breed back to the one or two that are almost pure that they have. Um, and they are very scrawny sheep. They're very narrow. Uh, they don't give a lot of meat. Um, they, they give very little wool, in fact, as well. Um, they only give about a pound and a half of wool. But it's so fine. It's like cashmere. And um, this is what they would have used to line their cloaks. It was very highly prized. And they would, they would um, shear them twice a year and get this very fine wool off them. And um, if you compare them with a the modern sheep, which you see at the bottom, they're completely different. A big, bulky one, lots and lots and lots of fur in all directions. And um, they would give six or eight pounds of wool, whereas the original little um, a uh, cladore sheep would give very little as well. Small sheep, yes, it kept in small flocks um, and the, the fine wool for spinning and weaving and um, two, uh, two uh, shears per year, shorn twice a year, yeah. So um, they are very pretty little sheep. They have a sort of dished head and they're, they're very nice and um, the 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 Cladore Sheep Society are trying to have them recognised by Europe, which would make them eligible for various grants under the agri-environment schemes. At present, they don't have any status because they're not recognised as a breed. So that's ongoing at the moment. So Bridget's Mantle, uh, I'm sure Liam Kenny will talk more about this in the next talk, but um, a, a fragment of Bridget's Cloak was taken uh, as a as a relic in around 1066 and it was taken from Kildare to England and then on to Bruges and it's been in Bruges ever since then and it has um, a, a, a sort of a curly texture that's it in the in the case on the left hand side and you can see a, a close-up photograph of it on the right hand side and if there are any weavers among you um, you know you have the warp and you have the weft and they, they would do sort of four lines of weft and then they'd put in tufts and then they'd do another four lines of weft and they put in more tufts. And when all of that was done, they would comb out the tufts and they would wash it and felt it. 
and that made the the curly uh, thing and it was really really warm it was like an extra layer of insulation and so you had this fine wool uh, in, 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 in a sort of very fine felt and um, this is this is still in this uh, in Bruges and I think you can see it by appointment but um, I'd love to see it uh, it's something I would very much be interested in seeing on the right hand side I, I, I just show something it's knitted it's not woven but you can see where it's it, when it's combed out and felted you get a completely different surface feel on the thing and this I'm sure is what they used for their cloaks to make them weatherproof and warm and there's a lot of weaving went on in the monasteries and um, the the Irish loved coloured clothes which they dyed with local plants and um, there are fragments of fabric that have been found over the years and usually it's a plain weave sometimes a twill weave plain weave is over one under one over one under one twill is over one under two over one and you get a sort of zigzag effect and you get all of these patterns in Irish woven clothes, which was quite sophisticated. And then they had the dye as well. So uh, uh, sometimes you see in, in uh, later manuscript illuminations where they're wearing checkered trousers. And um, this is what it would have been. They would have dyed the wool and then they would have woven two different color wools together in order to get a pattern. So it was quite sophisticated and again would have been done on a, a, a subsistence basis in the monastery. So the woolen mantle, you can see the men here wearing the woolen mantle and um, it's uh, wrapped around them and the hood is up and I'd say it was totally weatherproof, ideal for a night like this. Mm -hmm. And then they are wearing little leather shoes and these leather shoes would have been tanned from the hides of the cattle, the mature cattle, and you can see a sample of one there from an archaeological site. And in the manuscripts of the time you can see um, uh, the Virgin is wearing a very fine cloak with sort of gold decoration on it and this is described again in manuscripts and um, the gold decoration and underneath she has the linen shirt and the same with the saint on the right he's wearing shoes she isn't I don't know what the significance of that is but um, so you you know again the the outer clothes were manufactured on site as well as um, everything else so then the old Irish goat um, the goats have existed in Ireland since, um, again, they maintained since before the Ice Age, I somehow heard that, that they survived the Ice Age. I'm not 100% sure how that worked, but the Irish hare seems to have done it as well, so maybe in the extreme south. So they, they again, almost became extinct because they fell victim to this improving syndrome, and they brought in sun and goats that produced more milk and... Um, uh, more bulk on them as well and the Irish goats then fell out of favour and a lot of people couldn't bear to put them down so they let them out on the mountains and so there were feral herds of goats and local gun clubs were sort of shooting them and um, then sometimes um, the sun and goats were let out and they interbred and so you know the, it, genetically the, it was harder and harder to find purebred old Irish goats so one year uh, in Mulrani over in, in Mayo, um, a visitor from England who was interested in goats um, saw these out on the mountainside and said, you know, they look like old Irish goats. And the locals said, well, what is an old Irish goat? And um, they are, again, they're small. They have um, a, a, a slightly dished head. They have a long coat. Uh, they have a beard um, their ears go are up as opposed to the floppy ones that you get from the continental breeds and um these these um, goats out on the mountainside conformed almost exactly to this description so they they captured a number of them and again the dna analysis they did a project with trinity college and did the dna of the goats and um, selected the ones with the purest uh, lines uh, which they measured against uh, trophy heads uh, 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 retrieved from the 18th century and 19th century in old Irish houses and castles and things like that. And it was really great detective stuff. So they found what the old Irish goat would have looked like, and they had very distinctive uh, horns. 
and the one at the top left they used to call him handlebars and uh, you can see why and he um, he was around Mulroney for a long time and then he he's he's dead now but uh, he would have um, been related to a lot of the goats that they're keeping so I'm sure you've read about the goats on Holt Head um, they have a, a, a goat herd. This is this is the girl who, who looks after the goats, and she um, Melissa is her name. She she you don't drive goats. You walk in front and you call them, and then they follow you. And I'm sure this is exactly what happened in Bridget's time with the goats and the sheep, where you would walk and they would follow you, or you would ring a bell and they would follow you. And she calls. She does a goat call. And the goats all answer her. It's quite extraordinary. I saw a video of her, and it's it's really amazing. So it's a it's a it's a way of life that we have totally forgotten about, but somehow or other somebody there knows it, and presumably she will teach people, or people will want to learn when they see what can be done. And these goats seem to be well on their way. They have a captive breeding program, and um, the the numbers are going up. And they have managed to get themselves recognised by Europe, so they are eligible for incentive schemes and that sort of thing. So this is the uh, my my pet t uh, project. Um, because they didn't have donkeys and uh, or mules, they had ponies, and the ponies had to do all the heavy pulling and dragging. And uh, they, as there were no roads, um, they would have used slide cars or panniers, and their job was to bring uh, turf in or bring seaweed up onto the land for um, to make it. Um, more fertile and um, they uh, this the same story with the goats um, it, nobody knew they existed and then there was a man in Kerry and his sister was a historian and she'd read Charles Smith's history of Kerry and uh, in it he described small ponies in Kerry and uh, this man John Mulvihill uh, who um, whose father used to have a, a pony on the bog and um, he became very interested in them and he went out into the highways and byways and he found a number of ponies that all looked like one another, but didn't look like Shetland ponies and didn't look like Welsh ponies. They're small ponies, they're only about this height. And um, he gathered up about 20 of them and he started issuing his own little passports and things and tried to get the department to recognize them. And uh, it took him about 14 years for the department to come around to his way of thinking. Uh, but in the meantime, he was on the radio talking about this new breed that he had found and the head of Weatherby's DNA laboratory heard him and contacted John and said, look, that's really interesting. I'm interested in horses. I'll DNA type them for you. And he did, and they turned out to be a completely new breed or an old breed that, it, that had existed there for hundreds of years. And if you go back to the old manuscripts, they talk about garans, and that comes from gyar, which is short. And these horses, again, were unimproved ponies that lived in Kerry and later bigger horses came in with the Normans and with the Spanish uh, but these little ponies somehow or other have this ancient DNA and they um, they survived uh, right up to the 21st century. So Bridget drove in chariots. The, the society in Ireland was very hierarchical and it, like you wanted to be somebody important to have your chariot and um, they this is off a high cross the base of the high cross frequently show horses with chariots and it's always a pair of horses pulling it and then you have a coachman and you have somebody sitting behind uh, the, the the warrior with the so with this spear and the the technique was that the carriages made lots of noise and things like that so in a battle scenario you would drive up and then your your warrior would get out and he would fight and then if things were going bad he'd jump back into the chariot and move on somewhere else so people didn't actually fight from the chariot they used the chariot as to get around and then they got down and they they fought from the ground but they have reconstructed a number of um, vehicles from um, things found on archaeological sites and um, at the bottom there in the center you can see one of the reconstructions and they didn't use the the round collar that you see on horses didn't come in until the Normans so they weren't able to plow with horses because horses are built differently to cattle and if they had a, a rope around them which worked on a cow 
on a horse it would press against their windpipe and they wouldn't be able to pull anything very heavy. So two horses could pull two people easily and that was the norm and um, you had uh, there were five main roadways in Ireland, the Schlee, Schlee Moor, and a Schlee was big enough for two carriages to pass one another without bumping into one another. So the carriages were sort of prestige vehicles, and um, so you can see the way they were harnessed up there. Again, um, this is something that I'm quite interested in. I don't know whether I can do anything here or not. How do I do this? This is me on the current <laughs> and driving my pair of ponies. So uh, that was great fun. Um, so anyway, um, this is, I'm pretending I'm Bridget. <laughs> so uh, going, yeah. So anyway, um, no donkeys. So all of the things, all of the icons that we think are Irish, you know, the soda bread, the um, the donkeys. Uh, all of these things didn't exist until comparatively recently. So um, the, they didn't have them in the, in the fifth century, so no donkeys. They did have dogs, and the dogs were divided up into categories. On the, on the left-hand side, um, they had a, a gar. Now, a gar was like a, a hound that would go into cover and give tongue. And you would hear them giving tongue when they were, when they had the scent of their prey, and their job was to force the prey out onto open ground, and then the coo, uh, the sight hound, would course it on the open ground and bring it down. So those two worked more or less together. And then again, this was a, an aristocratic pursuit because only the aristocrats hunted, and the ordinary people weren't allowed to hunt. It wasn't part of their their daily um, occupation. Uh, and on the right hand side, you had the Arku, which was the, the slaughter hound, the big hound, that would have been part of the monastery that they would guard the gates at night time. And in the, in the sagas, the story of Cúhollán, you remember he fought the hound and everybody thought he would have been killed by the hound, but in fact, he killed the hound. So he became Cúhollán. Instead, he had to take the, the role of the hound uh, instead. So. Uh, this, these were three main things and again they found bones on various sites they found dogs with the big skulls and things like that so they know they existed um, and it just confirms what's written in the in the books then cats and chickens um, nowadays everybody lives on they say there are more chickens in the world than there are people and everybody lives on chickens uh, but in, in the early time the chickens were sort of scrawny they were more like fighting fowl you can see the tall and thin not a lot of um weight on them but their eggs would have been really prized um and so they were they were part of the the monastery scene uh, you can see the improved breeds at the bottom they're much bigger much heavier and um they've 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 been uh, improved so you just wonder how many of the genetics still survive and then on the on the right hand side uh, you have cats and down at the bottom, you have one that has been bred to, to almost not look like a cat anymore, you know. So, again, these things have been improved and got bigger and better and hairier and, you know, cuter and whatever. Um, but the the genetics, um, I don't know whether the fighting cocks go back. Again, there's a study going on on fighting fowl to see if their genetics go back any any anyway to link in with archaeological sites. But that that, that hasn't been published yet. So now we're getting to the end. The bees, the old Irish bee was the black bee. And they, there are wonderful law tracks describing um, the, the, who owns a bee and who owns the honey. And if the bee gets the honey, it gets the flowers from your land, how much of the honey are you entitled to? And if the bee flies over your field to get to my field that has the flowers in it, does the man whose field he flies over get <laughs> so they're, they, they tie themselves up in knots and this sort of thing and if uh, um, it, they used to exist in, in hollow trees and things like that and they were thought to be extinct but this year a tree blew over in bird domain and in the bottom of it there was a huge hive of black bees that had survived against you know all the odds and everybody was absolutely delighted that they were still there but anyway, the, the bees were, um, honey was 
the main source of sugar. <laughs> honey was really the only source of sugar, and so it was very, very highly prized. And so they, uh, for that reason, the beehives were always kept inside the monastery walls, inside the compound. And then again, in recent years, they brought in bees, new improved bees from outside, and they killed off the native bee and they brought in the varroa mite. And it's like, you know, importing foreign ash trees and the bringing in a fungus that kills off all the native ash trees. It, we're fine in isolation because, you know, we have existed for so long. But when you start bringing in things from outside, it upsets the balance of nature and something has to suffer. And usually it's the it's the native animal that suffers because it's not as well adapted to the the changes that they as the the modern breeds. So that is that that is that. And then last but not least, lice. <laughs> and uh, they were everywhere. And one of the monks uh, writing in a in a, a note on a margin said that um, in the middle of summer at midnight it was so bright that he was able to pick the lice off his clothes. <laughs> so so that's it. That's the end. Now just uh, that's that's my talk. But now I just want to talk for a minute about Bridget of Kildare, and I am delighted to see our friends from Solis Breed here. Um, in February of next year we're having an art exhibition. Um, to do with Bridget and um, I'm part of an artist group and um, we got funding from Kildare County Council and we had an open call for uh, artists to submit artworks and we had 240 submissions from 13 different countries which was amazing. So we uh, got somebody from the IMA, the Museum of Modern Art and somebody from the Art Department in Kildare County Council and they whittled them down to 50 pieces. And we have uh, spoken to um, businesses in Market Square in Kildare, and 28 of them have offered us their windows. So we're going to have a walking trail of art, and all the artwork has uh, been delivered here. It's all been photographed. The catalogue is being uh, produced just at the minute. It's all been designed, and um, the photographs have been put in. And um, we will be launching it at the end of January. And it will be a walking trail around Market Square in Kildare, where Bridget herself would have walked many years ago. So this is what a sample of one of the pieces that's in the exhibition. And um, it's, it's a, a beautiful piece by a, an artist called Leah Lembach. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's happening next year. So um, Bridget is still very much alive and with us. and. Um, Thank you all for coming. That's great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary, for that wonderful presentation <laughs> and, and that glimpse into the, the world of St. Bridget. Um, anyone got any questions for Mary or any comments? No, Mary, yeah. you talked about you know the calves that were killed off in September, October. Yeah. That probably came to our Halloween bonfire, Tina Canova. You're dead right. You're you dead were, right. Yes. Kind of, they sort of kind of the capital at yeah. the end of the, the year. Absolutely. And it would have been a time of feasting and, yeah. and whatnot. Yes. Two things to what you said I morning. never put that together. That's very, very good. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Very good. Um, yeah, the whole year was sort of mapped out, and yeah. we've lost that, you know. I mean, we get strawberries in December, like, you know, and we don't know, look, we don't know where they come from. And, you know, we expect an awful lot of things. Uh, somebody was talking about shoes. Who had the story early on about shoes? Um, yes, t tell, us, tell us that story. When I was in primary school in 1970, um, shoes were made in uh, 14 towns in Ireland. And now we don't make shoes, and we import shoes from 130 countries. Isn't that extraordinary? Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, we've just lost our way. Um, we, we don't produce enough our, our, our food anymore. We import it because it's cheaper. And, like, the quality is lower, and um, we don't know. It's so many air miles, like, stuff comes from avocados, come from South America, you know we can exist without avocados, you, you know. So there's an awful lot of things that we just, we're not thinking about what we're, what we're doing and how we're living, you know. And it's, it's really, 
I mean, this is an object lesson on how you can survive on what is around you. And, um, you know, we somehow think that people back then weren't very clever. You know, they were brilliant, you know, because they had this inherited knowledge, uh, all unwritten, you know, all learned from people who had gone before. They observed nature around them. They knew what was happening. They knew what to expect. And they, you know, they, they, they knew not to destroy nature because they depended on it, you know. So we've lost all of that. And this sort of intensive farming and intensive building and polluting rivers and, uh, you know, just, it's sad. It really is sad. We, we, I don't know how we can get around it, you know. I, there are various schemes now in, in, in Europe. Uh, they, they have introduced a number of agri-environment schemes where you're encouraged to have proper hedgerows with lots of varieties of things in it and not to cut them down to the scut and let birds nest in them and um, put out piles of sand for uh, solitary bees and to uh, maybe leave an acre of, of um, plant and thing. There was a scheme called Linnet which, and, uh, where you planted uh, oats and barley and wheat and you didn't harvest them and the heads were there for the birds to eat over the winter. And, um, you know, a lot of the hedge cutting now, you know, you're not supposed to cut your hedges between uh, February and the end of August. And as soon as the end of August comes, they come out with their flails and they take off every blackberry in, in, the, in the hedge. And like that was what birds survived on for the winter. They had to fatten up for the winter because it's, it's uh, the hungry time, you know, and that's all gone now. So your, you know, habitat has been decimated food has been knocked out of the park you know so it's it's really um you know the more you look at uh, life 1500 years ago the more we can learn from it really you know and it's so interesting that some of the animals have managed to survive into the present day you know the native rare breeds why was there no donkeys why were there no donkeys no donkey, i mean because i also had donkey more short water like on boggy land yeah, don no, donkeys uh, didn't come in until the 19th century. Yeah, no, it just says when the, it'd be more sh I thought it would be more short water than the, on the bogs. On the bogs. No, the yeah, little ponies the are ponies. pretty. You see, the ponies were light as well, you know, and um, they, they, they're they clever enough, like, you know, they, if they're used to walking on bog land, they'd pick out the, the, the solid bits, you know, and... Um, uh, you know, if a pony, even if if it's the right breed and it has, it's not used to bogs, yeah. it'll it'll walk and it'll bury itself in the bog. You know, uh, but it's like, uh, you know, people who farm sheep on mountainsides and then because of foot and mouth they had to put them down, and then the new sheep that came along didn't have the wisdom to shelter or to do all of the things because that had been lost, that generational gap had lost them. You know. So sometimes with ponies, uh, you know, if they're not used to being on the bog, they don't know how to walk on the bog. And the same with donkeys, it would have taken them a while to learn, you know, but they were light, but they had little narrow feet, you know. Yeah, yeah. so. Okay, well, if nobody has anything else, um, I think Mary is staying with us for our, our cup of tea outside, the courtesy of, of Nessa, our Hostess, just to, to mention again, um, the last in the, in the series of talks um, will be uh, Liam's talk, which will now be on the 8th, Monday the 8th of January, uh, here again. So hopefully we'll see you all uh, in January. Have a happy Christmas. Yeah.